Our first lesson this morning is recorded in the Old Testament book of the prophet Micah. We read from chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. You can almost picture a courtroom situation. God calls his people to court with the earth, with creation itself serving as witnesses. God reminds his people what he has done for them, the majesty of his works that he has performed for them throughout the years. But then he says to them, what have you done for me? And he reminds them what he wants them to do for him, to serve him in faith. Hear what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case to the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the complaint of the Lord. Listen, foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. Yes, with Israel, he will argue his case. My people... What have I done to you? How have I made you weary? Answer me. I brought you up from the land of Egypt and from the house of slavery. I redeemed you. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam before you. Remember, my people, what Balak, king of Moab, planned? And what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him for Shittim up up to Gilgal? That you may know the Lord's righteous acts. How will I meet the Lord? How will I bow down to the God of heaven? Will I meet him with burnt offerings, with one-year-old calves? Will the Lord delight in a thousand rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Will I give my firstborn for my sin, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, man, what is good. What does the Lord require from you? But to carry out justice and love mercy and walk in humility with your God. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson today, also our sermon text for this morning, is recorded in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. The words are very familiar. They basically say the same thing that God said through the prophet Micah. Paul reminds the church to remember their calling, which is to serve the Lord, not to glorify themselves For example, consider your call, brothers. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. Not many were powerful. Not many were born with high status. But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame those who are wise. God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are strong. And God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to do away with the things that are so that no one may boast before God. But because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, namely our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God did this so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. Please stand for the gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded in the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. In this portion of God's word, we hear, hear part of the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most familiar part. It's referred to as the Beatitudes, where the Lord reminds us how blessed we are to serve our gracious Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. He said these things, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In fact, that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the gospel lesson. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The words for our sermon this morning are, as Pastor Nance has pointed out, our second reading there in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We've heard those words, so we'll dispense with reading them again. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters in Christ, I have a question for you. And answer it honestly. Are you a fool? If anyone thinks that they are, please stand up. Oh, wait. I'm the only one standing. <laughs> Does that mean I'm a fool? Some might think so. But all kidding aside, haven't you ever been fooled? Like falling for a practical joke, like let's say on April's Fool's Day, and then afterwards you felt very foolish about it and said, oh, that was ridiculous. Besides parents pretending to fall for their children's little fool, April Fool's jokes. Or what about those times where maybe you said something or you did something and then afterwards your mom or dad or, or maybe a friend or someone else came up to you and said, you know, that was really foolish of you to do or to say. Has that ever happened to you? I think it's safe to say that in some way, shape, or form, all of us, at one time or another, have been fooled, or we have done something foolish, or said something foolish, and we regret having done just that. Take, for example, the over the 60 million people during this past presidential election who foolishly thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win, hands down, the presidency of the United States. Or take the other over 60 million people who voted for Donald Trump and how many think that they are fools for voting for him in the first place. You see, being a fool or being fooled in some ways can be a matter of perspective. From whose viewpoint? So, can I ask you, are you a fool? Because the word of God before us this morning actually addresses that question for us. As we look at these words of our Lord, as the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, we see that there is a contrast between worldly wisdom and God's foolishness. The world, that is, the unbelieving world, looks to its own wisdom, intellect, knowledge, and abilities, and strengths to accomplish the things that it feels it needs to accomplish. But in the process, it actually leaves mankind spiritually bankrupt. And unbeknownst to it, it leaves the world, mankind, wallowing in its own folly. You see, the, to the world, they consider it foolish, ridiculous to believe what the Bible says. To the world, it is foolish to accept God's word at face value, what you read or what you hear in it, because it goes against the world's intellect and wisdom. To the world, it's foolish to believe that 
The world was created in six 24-hour days out of nothing simply by the power of God's word. Because to the world, anyone with an ounce of intellect knows that the world came into existence by a big bang, boom, and that everything then evolved from a lower form to a higher form. And that's why human beings came from apes, so the world says. To the world, it is foolish to believe that you can rectify, you can amend your mistakes, your faults, your, your misdeeds. In other words, as the Bible says, your sins by your own ab abilities. Or to think that they can be, can be redeemed for by simply someone dying on a cross. To the world's it's foolish and ridiculous to imagine that just simply by the blood of one person's death there on Calvary can atone for the sins of the entire world. That makes no sense whatsoever. To the world, you don't need God. To the world, you can do it yourself. You can accomplish your own redemption. You can prove that you are worthy of being acceptable before God, whatever God you want in him or her to be, simply by your own intelligence, your own strength and abilities. That's the world's wisdom at play. And because of that, the world cannot and does not accept the truth of God's salvation, the message of the cross. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote just that earlier in the letter when he says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But what did God do? Paul tells us in our text, he says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You see, God chose the weak things, the very things that the world considers to be foolish and unacceptable to save mankind from his own destruction. God chose the way of the cross to save the world from sin. He chose to personally come into this world and take on the flesh and blood of humanity so that in our place he could live the perfect life that we cannot live. He chose to personally come into this world, take on our flesh and our blood so that he can make the ransom payment for sin. The payment that we cannot make. And that was the payment of his holy, precious blood. And all this he did for you, for me, and for this entire world. And that's the wisdom of God at work in our salvation. But the world cannot and will not accept that. To the world, God's plan, God's way is foolish. In fact, that's exactly what Satan, through by way of the world, wants you to believe and to accept. He wants you to reject what God has done for you, but rather to put your emphasis on you yourself, your intellect, your knowledge, your abilities, your strength. But to do so, in reality, is foolishness. It is foolish to think that you can, by your own strength and efforts, amend your sinful life. It is foolish for you to believe that you can make retribution for your own sins and thus make yourself acceptable before God by who and what you are and what you have done. Because the truth be told, no matter what you think, no matter what you do, when relying upon yourself, you're still guilty. You are still trapped in the clutches of sin without Christ. Without Christ, there is no forgiveness. Without Christ, there is no peace of mind or soul. Only the crushing weight of the guilt of sin pressing down heavily upon you. To foolishly deny what God has done for you through Christ Jesus really leaves you with what? 
What do you have? If you rely upon the things of this world, upon your own intelligence, your own abilities, then what are you left with? What do you really gain? Oh, they may be good for the things of this world. And you may accomplish a lot of things in this world with your own intelligence and strength and abilities. But what do you gain for all eternity? No matter what you believe, no matter what you think, there is no escaping the certainty that one day, each and every person in this world, no matter how wise or foolish they may be, will have to stand before the judgment seat of God and face God's judgment. To do so without Christ is foolhardy. To do so without Christ leaves one facing God's eternal wrath and punishment. And what comfort, what hope is there in that? But with Christ, come that day there is nothing to fear or nothing to worry about. But rather we can look forward to that day and with joy of knowing that on that day our Lord Jesus will say to us, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And the same holds true with death itself. When death comes our way, and I guarantee you it will come our way, what do you have at that moment without Christ? To rely on the wisdom of this world, to rely upon the world's strength and, and methods, leaves you with what? It leaves you really with just simply a rotting corpse in the grave and nothing else to look forward to. Because to leave this world without Christ is to leave it with fear and panic and terror in one heart, in one's heart. It is to do so with, with every last ounce of your strength and breath, holding on to and attempting to maintain life in this world because without Christ, there's nothing. There is absolutely nothing to look forward to. There is only the pains and horror of hell that one faces, even in their denying of such a thing. But knowing Christ as your Savior, knowing that he has removed the sting of death from you, knowing that his resurrection guarantees your own resurrection to eternal life, removes the fear, the panic, and the terror from your heart when it comes time to face death. And in their place, God instills in your heart the peace, the joy, and the certainty of knowing that with death, life, true life, eternal life, begins with God in heaven. And that only comes from knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The world does not believe that. The world looks to its wisdom and considers God's method foolish. But by the grace of God, you and I see that differently. By the grace of God, we have been led really to believe and to see the power of God at work in our salvation through the message of the cross. By the grace of God, you and I have been led to see the weakness and the folly of the world's methods and wisdom and what it looks to it to seek to accomplish in itself. But rather, by the grace of God, we have seen and been led to see where true wisdom is found. And that is, if you want, in the folly of God's method, the cross. By the grace of God, you and I have been led to see the power of God at work in that message in our lives. By the grace of God, our eyes have been, see, have been opened to see that it is God who is at work here. It's not mankind, it's not ourselves, but it is the Lord himself. By the grace of God, we have been led to see and to believe that God is the cause and source of who and what we are through Christ Jesus. As Paul says in our text, it is because of him, that is Jesus, that are, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You see, the truth is, God alone stands at center stage, 
with the spotlight shining on his love as revealed to us in the message of the cross. It is God alone who has saved us and called us to be, as Paul says, a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus. That, my friends, is true wisdom. But the world does not see it that way. The world does not want you to look at it that way. But remember, what God considers to be foolishness, the world considers to be wise. And what the world considers to be foolish is really the wisdom of God's salvation. And may you and I never rely upon the wisdom of this world, because what is it? It is truly foolish. But rather, may we rely upon the wisdom of God, the very thing that the world considers to be foolish, as the way of salvation. Because that foolishness of the world is the wisdom of God. It is the message of Christ crucified. And so I ask you again this morning, who really is the fool? Is it the person who puts their faith and the trust in God's word and promises? as revealed to us in his holy word? Or is it a person who rejects them as being foolish? May you heed these words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote, Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. Are you a fool? I hope you're God's fool. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together and confess our faith in our Lord Jesus with the words of the Apostles' Creed that you find on page 41 in the front part of our hymnal, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of God, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>